Uh, we are going to discuss Shaw's play Pygmalion. Well, I have been slightly inaccurate. We are not going to discuss the play. We are now going to discuss only one little aspect of the play which has intrigued people no end and has been doing so even now. That is, the play does not end where it ends. Generally, the curtain comes down at the end of the fifth act. This is a five act play. Here, we have, this is followed by an epilogue and which is almost like a chapter in a novel. Expectedly, people have found this intriguing, artistically offensive too, because if you read the epilogue, and almost all of us have read, I uh, here's a confession that this was a thing that we had to study at school. In fact, when I took my, I sat my ICS examination, IST examination, sorry. Uh, Pygmalion was a text and of course that was, at that time I, the, the prose and what followed was so breathtaking that one did not think whether it is artistically cogent, whether it sticks with the rest of it. But yes, the question still remains. And with that question, allied to that question, I should say, is another one. Why is a play called Pygmalion? And why does Eliza not marry Higgins? Or let us say, put it the other way, why does Higgins not marry Eliza? And why, of all people, Liza uh, marries a non-entity, an income poop, people would say, like Freddy. Uh, and then Shaw goes to some length justifying the choice. Now, what does he say about the choice? One is interesting. He says that Higgins is a man with a mother fixation. And if you remember in Act 4, in fact, uh, uh, earlier in fact, when Higgins comes to uh, Mrs. Higgins and says to her at home party and says that uh, I'm going to bring this woman which I have girl which I have picked up on the streets and Mrs. Higgins says oh well you you are never interested in anybody any woman less than 45 and Higgins says yes mother the only kind of a woman I am interested in is someone like you so Shaw becomes thorough to leave this uh, cue that Higgins is not going to marry by dropping the hint that he has an unresolved Oedipus complex. Or if you find that word strong enough, at least use Shaw's own words, a mother fixation. Right? And also the end, in fact, after the play proper ends, that is in, in the epilogue, he says, which what he says there is quite, quite interesting, quite interesting is that Eliza will not marry Higgins because Eliza knows that she will not have her influence on him. In fact, she will not be able to master him. Now, this is something to most people doesn't mean much. Ah, but if you are the Shaw detective, if you have gone through what Shaw has written, this gives away the whole show. Now, before I have a little theory, which maybe uh, I cannot explicate 
fully here. But I firmly believe that though Shaw was the world's most celebrated writer of comedies and, and definitely the best known wit in the 20th century, his genius was unsuited for comedy. Uh, pardon me for this blasphemy. It was beyond him because of certain personal reasons to write comedy as we truly understand this. Now, well, what do I mean by that? I mean that there are generally, particular, there are two kinds of, of, I'm of course simplifying, I'm taking extreme cases of artists. One kind is a Shakespearean kind. Not that he can write anything, although yes, he can, that is one thing. But the fact is, what he writes does not have a direct bearing on his own life. In other words, he is the man with the Keatsian negative capability. He takes the world, he pours himself into the world and he gets uh, into the skin of all, all the people he creates. An Iago, as has been said, and an Imogen. Shaw, on the other hand, I, I have personally found out, is a man who has, be, who tried to write a single play. All his plays taken together are so many acts in one play and everything that he wrote is has indirectly of course it cannot be directly it's everything is autobiographical in other words he cannot write a play where he is not dealing with a psychological with a personal problem a personal crisis a personal situation. That being so, it is, uh, if anybody who reads carefully what Shaw wrote before, before Pygmalion, and Shaw wrote Pygmalion when? Uh, I suppose it was written in 1912 when he was in his 50s, 56 to 12, uh, 52, it was first first produced in England in 1913 and uh, the lady who played Pygmalion, Mrs. Patrick Campbell, this is again for people who have uh, an eye for the offbeat thing, Shaw was infatuated by the woman, even before he came to write about and that infatuation almost grew, he became besotted uh, during the rehearsals. He was actually the director of the 1913 English production. And that was also, that is one reason why there is, if you find the kind of intensity in Shaw, in Pygmalion, it is, it is because Pygmalion is Shaw and in some ways, Eliza is Mrs. Patrick Campbell and the chemistry which it looks like working out and doesn't and somehow is aborted in the play is Shaw's own elaborately created persona which almost crumbles before what can be called the order de femina, the, the feminine smell that you all understand here. But why did I say that Shaw was incapable in my views to, to write a comedy? Well, I'll give you the, I'll try to explain. I'm reading out just five, four or five lines 
of a poem somebody wrote. Please listen. Here goes. Then must thou learn to stand absolutely by thyself, leaning on nothing, satisfied that thou canst know nothing. Sorry, canst nothing know. Responsible to nothing, fearing no power, and being within thyself a little independent universe. These lines are written in blank verse. And this is from a passion play. And this was written by a man called George Bernard Shaw. And this was the first literary venture in his life. An unfinished passion play written in verse. And these lines, as I said, it's a passion play. Please do not wonder what does it have to do with it. You will see the connection will come. These lines were spoken by Judas, Judas Iscariot, who in this play is the guru of Jesus. Now, why does a man of 20 say that you must be an independent universe? This Judas was the Shavian persona. It's very easy to work on Shaw if you, there are gold mines, you just have to uh, take the risk and, and go uh, below sea level and take a plunge. After this, to entirely, you, to understand Shaw, you have to read his plays, sorry, his novels. Did you know that he wrote five novels and there were, he began in 79. In 79 he was how old? 23? So between 23 and 27 he poured out his heart writing out five novels which no publisher would publish. One of them I believe could be quite interesting now but still uh, they were unpublishable, maybe, maybe. But even if you are reading Pygmalion, even if you are reading Man and Superman, you have a clue to them if you know these novels. Well, here is a man who says you can know nothing, you can't nothing know, you are not responsible, you are responsible to nothing, fearing no power, and being within the self a little independent universe, completely autistic, a parallel universe which does not interact with the real universe. Uh, do you guess that such a man cannot write a comedy? If he is a man and if that is the core of his personality that he retains later on when he becomes one of Europe's most celebrated writers, uh, someone who is an independent universe, if there is the Judas in Shaw, then Shaw cannot write comedy because comedy is the most sociable form of all arts. It is the most gregarious, the most, most social of all arts. Uh, unfortunately, when you speak about classical comedy, we go by Aristotle. Now, I said it's unfortunate because Aristotle uh, has only a few lines to speak on in poetics in the comedy. And what does he say? That comedy is the representation of men as worse than they are. And when he means worse than they are, mean, he says that not morally worse, but aesthetically, artistically worse. There is evil due to ugliness, not evil because of, of a kind of immorality. And 
then he doesn't say much. There are some from Aristotle scholars of comedy uh, who have explained or tried to explain comedy using this cue from, from Aristotle. Elder Olson of Chicago University, he is probably the best known among them. But there, there is a problem. This is a very incomplete, uh, even when he speaks about, uh, or when we apply this theory to old comedies, old Greek comedies, and even if we apply them to Aristophanes, it, it might stick. But if we think of the great writers of comedies, probably of all the writers of comedies in the history of the world, I would place no one higher than Moliere. And no comedy higher than the misanthrope. But then, the man who more than Aristotle tells us, gives us, tells us about the secret of comedy is Francis Cornford, Francis MacDonald F.M. Cornford, The Origins of Attic Comedy. Aristotle also, they agree that comedy rises from this, con there is this carnivalesque phallic songs and processions where you had this whole lot of people, they had a maypole, something dressed up as a phallus and it did two things. Celebration of fertility, obviously the phallus standing for fertility, the principal fertility. And it was also something that waded off or staved off evil. Now the, the, here there are two parts. One, in these processions from where comedy began, especially from the chorus of comedy began, there was abusive, obscene, slanging matches, the kind of things that you still uh, get if you go to the wedding processions in, in rural Bihar. But at the end of it, there was a conviviality. The enmity gone, feasting together, drinking together, that is why it's a carnival. From this you had the next development, of course they had these processions where uh, the bearer of life, something was dressed. He carried the sin of the community and then he was killed and later on revived. From that you have Christ because people who have worked on Christ, this was a pre-Christian pagan uh, rite. And from this ritual you have both the Christian ritual and from this you have both tragedy and comedy. Comedy because, I'll, now I'll, I'll connect the two. Ostensibly in comedy, if you see, uh, if you say uh, Aristophanes' clouds, there Socrates is reviled he is kicked, he is beaten up, and his academy is burnt down. Fine? So we have these violence matches, these abuses and all stuff that, that Confort says and what Aristotle says is there. But what about this fertility part? What about the other part? That I said Confort said that there is death, symbolic kind of a death of Socrates or what Socrates stands for. And where is the revival? You don't have that so much in, in the clouds, but you have in symposium where Plato says that Socrates was among the closest associates of, of or I could put it the other way, that Aristophanes was among the closest associates of Socrates. So what is it that we have in comedy that there is a lot of slanging, lot of criticism, lot of abuse, but what sets comedy apart 
from from uh, satire is at the end of it there is a dissolution of this enmity and there is finally this revival the the old year goes the new year comes that's the reason why you in comedy you always have the father defeated the son triumphs but then is a uh, the person who is being killed is again being revived and that in comedy great comedy we have this kind of a reintegration of someone whom you threw away as undeserving now i'll give you an example this is what i have said on a theoretical basis and this is a ritualistic basis take for instance a play that some of you have read and a character which all of you are familiar with but it another play the character is falstaff the play is not henry the 4th but merry wives of windsor in merry wives sir john is worthless sir john is a glutton sir john is a lecher he was always a glutton he was always a lecher but worthlessness he has lost some of his some of his uh, luster some of his zest and these women they find a way around him they trap him and they thrash him but after getting a very good beating at the end of merry wives what is it that we have the day is a feast and foster is is invited to the feast now many of you would know what a feast stands for in shakespeare those of you who have read macbeth know that very well feast is the ultimate integration of the self and others into a common society so uh, what i have said about confort's theoretical explanation of these rights of expulsion and this and after that or killing and then reinduction or 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 rejuvenation or uh, the re renaissance the rebirth is what you have here in the play that i have mentioned or if you are not bored enough uh, take this example of winter's tale again a play that some of you uh, must have read there again this is of course symbolically done in this romance what is it that we have uh, hermione is imprisoned leontus thinks his wife is dead he does that out of his jealousy because he thinks that his wife was uh, had defiled his bed and was there with polixenus and later he finds out everything about her and he again goes into a to deep remorse a paroxysm of remorse and what is it that we have then that this lady is revived to remember the statue some of you have read uh, the story this play she is revived the statue comes to life hermione's revival so again what does that stand for the for the dead coming back to life so this the process first someone who is being killed symbolically read this being killed and then being revived again being brought back into life this is the process this magic this process of magic this is not the only play in shakespeare that you have that you have that in the other romances also this is shakespeare's last play uh, that is the tempest but you also have in one of his uh, more spicy or, or uh, comedies march ado about nothing if you know about this the benedict beatrice affair where they the but the claudio and and hero story where hero is taken for dead and then hero comes back to life the fact that we have this again and again in so many plays means that this idea of revival the rising from death is a feature which is embedded in comedy no of course when i say dead it does not always mean literally that the dead comes back 
come back to life. But the fact is, metaphorically what it means is that someone who has been criticized all over the coals is finally reintegrated. Example again is how, say, Malvolio is, is mollified. He is, as I said, uh, how Angelo is, uh, is reconverted, how uh, Oliver changes his heart, how the Duke becomes a changed man. Angelo is, of course, in measure for measure, the Duke, as you know, is in the Tempest, in all these plays. Now, that means, come back to come back to Shaw, that means that all the great comedies have seen that there has to be the reason you, you go so far, but that like true religion or like the spirit of true religion, the people whom you are expelling have to be reintegrated, have to be uh, brought back into life. For that you need a kind of a sympathy and empathy and more than that there you have to go beyond reason into a leap of faith. Where that leap of faith does not exist even if the man is ethically the best man in the play he is excluded. Alsace in, in, in uh, Moliere's La Misanthrope because he doesn't have this charity, he doesn't understand this. And so there is uh, Philante and, and uh, who is much, much inferior to Alsace morally, who gets the hand of Eliante. We have Morose in, in, in Ben Johnson's uh, Epicunia or, uh, or the Silent Roman, who again is not a rascal. But he has almost Volpe on his fate because he lacks that virtue, the virtue of social integration. Now, having said that, the virtue of anybody who does not have this virtue of social integration, this charity to, to go beyond what reason tells you, will is finally, you cannot create the final society of comedy and uh, I'll try to make it short now from here I'll take can I take another 15 minutes to wrap the things up uh, okay uh, if you read this the, the four or the five novels that I mentioned you would see that all of the protagonists are like this man Judas they cannot integrate they are all independent universes. There is Connolly in uh, the irrational knot who has married and then who doesn't know why he is leaving his wife, but he leaves his wife and tells his wife that he will he does not mind at all if she makes love to other people. And if you read the novel now, you would see that he gives us no reason except the fact that he is uh, an island. He is almost, I would say, autistic. He is an alien. Now, come here. What is the story of Pygmalion? Pygmalion is taken from Book 10 of Metamorphosis by Ovid, where Pygmalion is a sculptor who has created a lovely sculpture and it's so lovely that he is fascinated and falls in love with her, Galatia. And then there is a day of, of a worship of, of Venus or Aphrodite and there he prays to Venus that he wants to have a wife. His prayer is someone like Galatia. And Venus answer to him is his brain. She understands and Galicia is brought, is, is given life. So a block of stone is given life by the artistic touch. That, therefore, you, again, that 
accords very well with Coleridge's idea of secondary imagination, where imagination is actually makes what the art is akin to God. All of you have, all of you have read your bibli uh, biography literary. But now look at what Shaw has done in the play. He has written a romance, and again, anybody who knows Shaw well would, uh, would immediately think, "Are he looked a key again? He melodrama likhechena, domestic comedy likhechena, Candida likhechena." And what was Candida all about? Candida. Finally, we saw that the strong man moral was the doll. He says that that is what Shaw's answer to Ibsen's doll's house. And Candida, the so-called virgin mother, is not life-giving. She is, Shaya Nuran, remember, uh, she is very much like this character from Strindberg's play, The Father, where Laura, and uh, if you have read that play, this is character Laura. Laura says when Laura looks upon the captain as a son and she knows that the relation between man and woman, between lover and beloved, mistress and man, is one of antagonism, one of hostility. You have that in Miss Julie, you have that in so many plays. And she said, when you came to me as, when I went to you as a mother, it was a joy. But then making love to one's son. And when he came to as a man, oof, she felt defiled. And as a result, she destroyed him. Remember, no, you, you don't probably, under, if you read Candida well enough, very, very minutely, you will see that all of his self-respect, moral self-respect, vanishes at the end. And moral clings to Candida as that baby and sits in the baby's chair. So this virgin mother, this domestic comedy, actually is a reenact man. And this is what sets Shaw apart from Strindberg and Ibsen. Shaw will never go nakedly. He will not confront the truth. He will always sugarcoat that. And there are a lot of people still read Candida as something of happy ending. But if you read this again, second time, third time, you understand, I find it completely, I, I, I shudder at what Candida has done to, to uh, moral. And at least one very perceptive critic, Shaw's friend, said Beatrice Webb called Candida a prostitute. Whether or not she's a prostitute, she has done uh, moral. So this is the domestic comedy. And there is uh, there are at least two uh, melodramas. One is uh, the devil's disciple, and the other is Captain Brassbound's conversion. Devil's disciple, I'll just say in one. The other one, I will leave for the time being. Uh, in that play, there is one man, Dick Dudgeon, who it's about the American Revolution, and at that time they are fighting under uh, the leadership of Anderson, Minister Anderson, and. Uh, Anderson has a pretty wife and she, the wife thinks that Dick loves her and actually he is captured. Dick, they think that they have captured Anderson and Dick says, yes, I am Anderson. In other words, he gives Anderson, it's almost silly uh, cotton type of this thing, uh, two cities, gives Anderson a chance to escape and he is ready to take the news around his neck. And of course, in the nick of time, Anderson comes and, and, and nobody dies. But then there is a dialogue in which this lady, Mrs. Anderson, thinks that Dick, Dick answers that what I have done, I have done because it is in my nature. I do not love you. So I, he was willing to die, but the reason Shaw wrote this is to overturn, is to turn this theory, the formula of, of a melodrama upside down. And again, in the other play, where Lady Cicely, this was written for uh, Ellen Terry, comes across as someone who is lovely and romantic lady, who finally says that I, I appear to love you all, take care of you all, because I have never been in love with any real person. So whenever he takes a play and he says he writes a melodrama, he is 
turning mel melodrama upside down. His writing domestic comedy is turning the laws of domestic comedy upside down. Here he is writing a romance, writing a romance, sorry. And what does he do? Finally he says that we do not have to thank God or something like this, uh, pickering that we have finished with an affair, no more artificial duchesses. And Eliza breaks down, throws slippers. He had taken a real woman, a woman, and turned her into an artificial duchess, a thing, and a presumptuous insect is the term that he uses. In other words, uh, look at what happened. A block of stone was taken, a statue was taken, a statue was turned into a, a woman, a human being. Here a human being was taken and then human being is finally is disoriented and she is, she is turned into a thing. Her life is dropped. Now you may think sir, this is a, a little, a very far-fetched uh, interpretation of the play. Did Shaw mean that? Now I could have given you uh, Rollerbot's answer. What Shaw really felt is not so. But yes, I'll give you Shaw's answer. Uh, I'll cut back to something much earlier. In fact, in Man and Superman, if you go through again Man and Superman and other plays, we'll also see that uh, every time a marriage takes place, every time a man capitulates, he is overcome by a sense of tragedy, kind of failure. And the best is Man and Superman, where this man, Tanner and Anne, there is, you think it's, it's, it's comedy, but Tanner calls all the nasty names and Tanner is absolutely sanguine that he has been defeated. And the real comedy, where man transcends sexuality and love, takes place in hell, where the statue and Don Juan, and Don, there's a famous line there where Don Juan says, in hell they speak nothing but love and beauty. You just read the interlude and you will get it. This was uh, played here uh, by Nasiruddin Shah. Uh, Nasiruddin Shah and Shatya Dev Dubey. Dubey was then alive. Uh, okay. Uh, so this is, come back to, to Pygmalion. Pygmalion is the theme the one that I say Shaw half-heartedly just touched upon the thing. If you read the uh, episode dedicatory, Shaw speaks of an artist who is so, so immoral that he can wreak disaster. He can cause disaster. He can take the mother's milk, meaning of course the child dies out of hunger, and mix with his paint. He can starve and let his family starve only if that allows him to act Hamlet better. But then he says a lot of other things to forget that. You would think, did he ever write about such an artist, that immoral artist, who runs counter to his idea of the artist philosopher? There, there is one insignificant play. Uh, when the, the Dr. Zulema, there is a character called Louis Duveda. He is, uh, who is actually a model on Karl Marx's uh, son-in-law, not son-in-law, but who was a living, one, uh, 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 Edward Aveling, someone uh, who was one of Marx's avowed disciples. But that, but later on, the second play on which there was you have to edit a lot, the The second play on which uh, he really writes, and I said that you would ask whether he has written this. Yes, this, as I, I I might have told you some 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 day or some someone of you, is actually this the heart of Pygmalion is just as uh, Candida was a rewriting of a doll's house where the man is a doll. This is 
a rewriting. If you have read Shaw's articles on Ibsen, and if you have read the, a book called The Quintessence of Ibsenism, you would know that no one had a greater influence on Shaw possibly than Ibsen. Almost no one. And this is a, in fact a reenactment, a rewriting, sorry, of Ibsen's last play. What is Ibsen's last play? When We Dead Awaken. If you have not read When We Dead Awaken, it is about an artist and his model. The artist's name is Rubeck, and uh, he, the model's name is Irene. Actually, uh, they meet, he was the model on which uh, Rubeck had used her for his sculpture and then she vanished out of his life. She vanished because Rubeck was like this man that Shaw speaks of in Man and Superman, self-obsessed, hugely egoistic in a way and did not think of anything except a means, another model. I used her for, for my work. And that made her, Irene, the model, one who was giving strip tease on, on later on for public shows, on turnstiles. And they meet again. And then Irene tells him that she is dead. And she also tells him that though Rubek thinks he's a great artist, there is a little passage. I didn't coldly, as before, I want to tell you something, Arnold. Arnold is Rubek. Well, I never loved your art before I met you and afterwards either. But the artist I read means me. I detest the artist. The artist in me too, most of all in you. Whenever I, I undressed myself and stood there naked for you, uh, I hated you, Arnold. In terms of iron, you didn't. That's not true. I hated you because you could stand there so unmoved. Lahabs, unmoved, you believe that? So infuriatingly self-controlled then. And because you were an artist, not a man. Here, uh, Higgins speaks about his Miltonic mind and he also likens himself to the creator. So if you say he's just a phonetician, he's, he's an art. In fact, he is modeled after uh, Rubik. And uh, here, actually, what he has been doing is uh, explained by a bear hunter. This man, this bear hunter, whose name is Ulfiam, says, tells Rubek's wife, We both like working with hard material, ma'am, both I and your husband. He likes wrestling with blocks of marble, I imagine, and I wrestle with hard sinews of bears, and both of us force our material down under control. At last, become lord and master of we never give up till you have overcome it, no matter how much it fights back. So, Ulfiam sees the artist as someone who is a master, a controller, uh, someone who dominates. And somehow he kills bears and the artist kills, except in his art, he also kills souls. In other words, he is sees the anti-social face of, of the artist. Uh, and then, at that time, at that time, much, much before he wrote this play, he was, Shaw was 35. In the major critical essays, he writes about this play. The sacrifice of a woman of stone age to fruitful passions which she herself shares, means sexual passion between two people.
people is nothing compared to the resting of the modern woman's soul to gratify the imagination and stimulate the genius of the modern artist. You see the similarity now. Poet and philosopher. He, that is Ibsen, shows us that no degradation ever devised or permitted is as disastrous as a degradation and through it women die into luxuries for men and yet can kill them. And what remains to be seen is what will happen when we dead awaken. He was writing an essay on dead awaken. And then I have just taken a few and the reward of iron is that when the, when the work is uh, is that when the work is finished, these are all Shaw's words, and the statue achieved, he says, thank you for a priceless episode, at which significant word, revealing as it does, that she has after all been nothing to him, but a means to an end, she leaves in him and drops out of his life. That was the first time. Later on, they move again, and then it ends in a tragedy. So, dead are awakened. And what does uh, Higgins say here? Pickering, thank God that this episode is over. This frightful, ex this ex uh, remember, I, I'll just, he says that this, uh, Hmm. That, that that this this uh, story is over, and then when uh, she throws the, her shoes and says, "What is to become of me? What is to become of me?" Remember, everybody remembers, no? It's in the, that is uh, in Act Four. Higgins says, "Answer to Kyoche. How the devil do I know what is to become of you? What does it matter? What is to become of you?" And Tarake Obolache, no more artificial duchesses speaking. And thank God that this that this boring this episode is over. So Shaw, we dialogue. He is putting those dialogues, the same situation, the same character, the same relationship. As a critic, he can critique Ibsen and show that he is completely alive to Ibsen's genius. But as a writer, instead of facing the fact that Higgins is Rubik before his redemption. He gives us and then dodges past this, this main theme and finally makes him a kind of a godfather and provides, uh, gives, makes uh, Colonel, Colonel Pickering provide him, provide her with money and set up a shop. And Freddie is the wife, the husband, and writes a passage, in fact, a story as a sequel, as an epilogue. Now, do you get? If we, uh, there, I don't, I don't want to continue on this, but I just want to tell you that if you read the Metacritical essays, the quintessence of Ibsenism, and you read Pygmalion, and as I said, if you read the other great writers of comedies and, and romances, you know that this is an ironical inversion of romance. Instead of working on the theme, instead of confronting the fact, instead of against recognizing publicly that candidate Jerome doll house is on engagement, that kind of engagement is with when we did awaken. And this is a very a serious play where he is confronting the the antisocial, the nihilistic tendencies in his own soul. I mean, will that there was a quarrel with himself? He sidesteps the issue after tamely is almost like a strain in music and moves away and gives you a kind of a happy ending. He cannot marry because as I said, he, that leap of faith, the uh, you have to love yourself and, and then love one. That love is not possible for him. So the Higgins says that Higgins loves his mother and, and Eliza cannot be. And Eliza therefore marries Freddie, who is a non-entity. And he cannot follow this up because that would 
take his place in a direction completely so different. Shatta, in his last phase, Shaw connected successful virtually. That kind of nihilism he is not yet prepared to confront. As a result, here we have two plays, two lines conflicting with each other, and finally, an artistically unsuccessful and unsu uh, unsatisfactory attempt. First, Higgins does not marry Eliza because the Shavian hero could not accept the human condition. He always had a tendency to levitate. And th that is one reason why I believe that Shaw's temperament was not suited to comedy. And Higgins, again, like all the heroes, most of the heroes preceding him, or, the, or the, all the great men preceding him, and uh, moves away, remains single. That is reason one. And here, Shaw has, Shaw has been working again on the theme of Ibsen. He, it is a reworking on Ibsen's play, When We Did Awaken, but the difference between Ibsen and Shaw that he did not have Ibsen's intensity, directness, and the ability to confront, frankly and, and intensively, the nihilistic tendencies in his own self. And that is why that part which was introduced was not uh, explored exhaustively. And that is the reason why it, be as an, it becomes, in my opinion, an artistic failure.